So welcome again to the cycle of conferences um, entitled Situating Space Technology Between Lab and Field Sciences, sponsored by the Catalan Society for the History of Science and Technology. So this cycle uh, seeks to place satellite technology, uh, it, it interacts it interrogates the, uh, its, the relationship between sat, uh, satellite technology and field sciences and natural history practices. Uh, we bring to the, together three excellent scholars, experts in different aspects of history of science and technology, and that um, they all encounter in various ways uh, the question of lab and field borders as it applies to earth orbiting satellites. Um, today is the second session. Uh, last Wednesday, it was Christine Harper who lectured. Today will be Sebastian Gresmul. And next uh, Wednesday, the last Wednesday, will be Chungling Va. Um, again, thank you to all of, the, all of you to being uh, willing to participate in this conversation. Um, after Sebastian Gresmul, uh, Chungling Va will provide some comments. And then we will open the discussion. Uh, as usual, you can uh, leave your question on, on the chat. You can raise your hand or, and even during the discussion, you can express whatever thoughts come to your mind using the chat option. Um, so let me introduce uh, Sebastian. Uh, Sebastian Grebsmull is a CNRS researcher at the Center at the Centre de Recherche Historique of the Col des Autitudes and Sciences Sociales in Paris. Uh, he's a historian of science, technology, and environment who specializes in environmental history and visual studies. Uh, he has written mainly on the geophysical sciences, environmental history, polar history, and the history of explorations, visual culture, and the role of images and metaphors in science. Uh, he's the author of La Terre Vue de Nous, L'Avancion de l'Environnement Global in 2014. And it is an honor to have you here, Sebastian. So whenever you are ready, uh, you can begin. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gemma. Uh, thanks a lot for organizing uh, this cycle of uh, conferences, of three very interesting conferences, three talks. Um, uh, you organized, thanks a lot. And thanks a lot to everybody for joining us today. Um, on uh, on an is another issue on the field and lab border. Uh, last, last week we heard Christine Harper talk about the field lab border in meteorology. Today we will talk about something quite related to meteorology actually because we'll talk about ozone science in Antarctica. And uh, that research is based uh, mostly on um, on research I did for um, uh, for my PhD thesis, uh, partly, uh, and later on I published some of it in uh, La Terre Vue d'en but also on the metaphor of the ozone hole and the images. And I'll basically talk about all of that and spe specifically about the field lab border. Good. And um, so this story basically can be told in um, very much about, it's very much about dichotomies. It means uh, we can talk about two radically opposed institutions, the British Antarctic Survey and, uh, and NASA. We can talk about it as a, as a way to talk about polar, it's that it's polar science versus space sciences. Or you can talk about it also as something like fundamental sciences versus big science, because uh, the British Antarctic Survey was a lot engaged in fundamental, uh, fundamental science and ozone science. And uh, NASA, of course, was is as the big institution engaged in big science. And so you have also quite uh, different budgets involved. If the economies are very different, of course, of the British Antarctic Survey, especially of the ozone group and of the big science on the other hand and NASA. And you, you could also talk about it as uh, the opposition between a very sparse field data and a lot of data that you get from space, because the ozone scientists, when they were doing their research in Antarctica, they would have maybe two or three readings a day, mostly three readings a day. And on the other hand, you will have 
up to 200,000 daily readings of ozone from the satellite. So there, these are very two highly opposed worlds um, that came together and brought about a new geophysical uh, phenomenon or brought about new knowledge about a geophysical phenomenon that happens still today every year, the Antarctic ozone hole. So uh, this very same geophysical phenomenon, we can ha have a look at it from very two different perspectives, two broadly opposing scientific traditions. And we will find out where they cross, how they cross, and what that can tell us about field and laboratory sciences in Antarctica. So um, I will give this talk will basically be structured a lot around, uh, it, I will show you a lot of images. Just at the beginning, I will talk about two concepts I would like to discuss a bit more. So you ha will have a bit of text there, but all the rest will be images. And um, uh, the text is only there that I don't forget to talk about most of the things that I want to talk about. So let's start with the uh, infrastructural globalism from Paul Edwards. Now, Paul Edwards proposed this concept in a vast machine in order to tell us much about why models are so important for the geophysical sciences during the Cold War, how we can make global data and how that data becomes global, and what kind of frictions may be involved between diff in the, within this process, because mostly when well, he talks about most about satellites and satellites are of course planned in a long time in advance and you never put the same instrument on the next version of the satellite. So of course, what you want to have, you want to have an improved new instrument and so on. So there's always friction between each satellite that you put on because it's never the same instrument. So that in, in the, on the British side, uh, the British Antarctic Survey, when they were doing their ozone work, they always used the same instrument. So there's no data friction involved. So that's why this concept is uh, quite interesting for our case. But it's also interesting for the two other points for making global data and making data global, because uh, the British Antarctic Survey, when they did their ozone measurements, they did highly local measurements. That's why they didn't talk about the ozone hole when they published their findings. They, they talked about stratospheric ozone depletion, and they were talking about depletion above Halley Bay. So it was a very local observation. That's what a Dobson spectrophotometer does. It looks vertically up into the sky and measures the vertical column of ozone in, this, in the whole atmosphere and stratosphere. So it is a very local observation. But since these observations are connected also to a global ozone network, you get also an idea about global distribution of ozone. Although you get a much better idea with the satellite. So satellites, of course, will give us the global perspective, whereas um, the British Antarctic Survey will give us a very highly local perspective. And that is also expressed in the way in the, how the papers were published. It explains also why NASA invented the ozone hole metaphor and not the British Antarctic Survey and so on. But it, explain, well, it explains actually many things that we will discover all along this talk. Now, um, there is another thing uh, that is important for um, our, um, our discussions about the field lab border, and that is uh, the spatial term and uh, our, the more close attention that can be played to, be, to space and place within the production of scientific knowledge that what we call usually the spatial term. And in, the, in his book um, on um, uh, Robert Kohler in um, this great book on biology, landscapes and labscapes, exploring uh, the lab field border in biology. It's a really interesting book telling you the history about biology and ecology and the borrowings that went on between the lab and field border. And it's very interesting to see that until the 19th century, those two terms didn't, it, they only started to make sense in the 19th century. Before that, you didn't, have, you couldn't make that distinction because nobody talked about lab and field in the way we talk about it today. And it's only at the end of the 19th century that one, that it became problematic to borrow from the laboratory in the field. That we would say, these, these high precision instruments, how can you take them into the field? And will they produce the same things? Is it allowed to do that? And so on. many questions that were introduced 
that only happened in the late, late, late 19th century. And in the same way in Antarctica, um, we can observe similar things all along the 20th century where this distinction between field and lab becomes very problematic. And we will see in this talk, we will see why this is, has become problematic. It's also interesting because laboratory yeah, is usually considered as, the, as completely independent of place that you could reproduce the experiments anywhere on the world which is today often not true and you often don't do that because it's not very boring to reproduce exactly the same thing. But it's also often impossible because the infrastructures, the laboratories we use today are often that complex that you can't really replicate the exact same thing anywhere else. So and the field scientists by definition, of course, they are engaged in the field and they are by definition place bound. And so there is always this tension between this universal reproductibility and the very local specificity. And this tension is very important because it gives a different authority to scientists how they talk about specific places and specific environmental phenomena or geophysical phenomena. And so what, what you can observe, for example, when you look at the oral history interviews that were made most notably by the British, um, um, at the British Library, the, the oral history project they have going on there. And you, you, you see that the British Antarctic survey scientists, they are very much connected to, to place because they always go down. To, it's, a, it's a hard effort to go to Antarctica. It's a very difficult place to conduct science and they are very attached to place and they have a big authority when they talk about Antarctic ozone. And it comes also from the, this very this uh, difficult engagement with the field, and this uh, is not at all perceived in the same way by the space science community, of course, as we will see. And so there is always this tension that arises automatically between these traditions. However, uh, as we will see, ozone science implies a lot. Um, uh, there, there are a lot of laboratory-like conditions that are also necessary to produce ozone science. So we will look at this in the following. And um, so and that's why in the 20th century, uh, the, the, there was this, this distinction between the lab field border has become problematic, especially in Antarctica, where because when you move in the field, uh, you have uh, the place where you study, or let's say, um, all the strategies, the resources you use, the techniques you mobilize in order to guarantee, uh, one could say, the survival of the scientists in the field in this hostile environment. So all these resources, they are of course linked to the strategies and resources needed for the production of the scientific knowledge in Antarctica. So this comes always together. And uh, in this way, I think it is good to think about Antarctica actually as a unique laboratory. And that's how one often talks about Antarctica, especially since the 20th century. Well, actually only since the 20th century, but uh, as a laboratory in an extended sense, meaning it's, you can basically test anything there. It's like a blank space, a white blanket, and you can project a lot of imaginaries, a lot of ideas, a lot of theories on this continent. And that is precisely the case when you think about Antarctica as literary, uh, uh, literary uh, laboratory, because a lot of uh, literary imaginaries were projected there along the 18th, 19th century. You have it as a social utopia. You have it also for legal models, because Antarctica, the Antarctic Treaty, is used as a legal model to think outer space and the deep sea, uh, the law of the sea. It's, it has, it was, it is a precedent for all international planning of legal models for international spaces. And of course, that's what, that's why it's called Antarctic analogy in the, in the legal sciences. Or you have it also, of course, as a, a laboratory for political systems, meaning uh, you can test uh, ways of engaging uh, in um, the Antarctic Treaty so is, a, for example, a model to test how can you put uh, territorial claims aside and invent a new model uh, where science is the 
uh, replaces the geopolitical aspects that were very important before that and that are still are, but science is the new uh, currency that uh, with which you can engage in this geopolitical engagement. And um, so there are, and there are plenty of other ways to test uh, or to see Antarctica as a laboratory. Just uh, the, one tests, of course, space equipment there uh, because, uh, because of the isolation and the harsh environment. You can test, of course, uh, the psychology of isolation there. Uh, you can even, uh, you even have Werner von Braun, the, founder, the founding father of the, uh, of the uh, American space program. He also traveled to Antarctica to see firsthand how do you organize research in a hostile environment very far from any place uh, in the world where you can uh, where, where you don't have access to the re where you have to bring everything with you in order to survive in that environment so that's why also the Werner von Braun and uh, Ernst Studinger and other people from NASA the early founders of NASA they traveled also to Antarctica to see firsthand how you how you can organize these efforts, and uh, so the, uh, and of course today Antarctica is the uh, laboratory for as to observe global environmental change. So it's a global laboratory in this sense. So why is uh, um, let's have a look at Antarctica more closely as a um, uh, it's uh, in its geographic geophys geographical and physical geographical setting. So. It is, of course, an extreme environment where you have uh, a lot of ice in, on average, three kilometers of ice. That means you're always, when you work with, with it, on the continent in Antarctica, you always work at high altitude. And it, that, it, it's not only that it's difficult to work at high altitude, but of course, there are also very harsh weather conditions and half of the year, you don't have a lot of light or no light at all. So. That means the, the context is extremely difficult. And upon uh, you, you could add to that, of course, also the geopolitical context. So, and that you have um, the, the different claims here, the different sectors uh, of the different claimant nations uh, you can see here on this uh, map. And let's have, if we look at the British claim, which is the, the wedge, um, the wedge on the, um, uh, so be between nine and eleven o'clock, uh, this wedge is um, also overlapping with the Chilean claim and the Argentine claim. And um, Halley Bay, where the observations were made, uh, is just uh, next to one of next to the Argentinian one of the Argentinian bases, uh, scientific uh, stations. And uh, not too far from the German station, so you have you would have so you have always the nations that are climate nations. They would also put their bases, of course, within their sector to make sure that this claim is maintained. Although that the claims were put aside by the Antarctic Treaty, of course. So, but that that gives you an idea what science in Antarctica, what it means also as a geopolitical as within a geopolitical. Um, as a geopolitical setting. And science has become the, uh, since the International Geophysical Year, the main engagement in science. And the International Ge Geophysical Year in 1957-1958 brought fundamental science to Antarctica. And amongst that, ozone research. And since then, ozone research is done in Antarctica on a highly regular basis, almost without any interruptions. And that is very important for our story because uh, the British Antarctic Survey is really, and especially this man, uh, Jonathan Shanklin, uh, to, who published together with Joe Farman and uh, Brian Gardner, the famous paper on the ozone um, depletion. Uh, the, is the, the British Antarctic Survey is the only institution in the world that has an extremely high currency or high authority to talk about ozone in Antarctica. And that is precisely because they, just like the Keeling curve on Mauna Loa in Hawaii, uh, you have the same thing here for ozone, starting also with the International Geophysical Year and going on till today, a huge data set, a database that was always done with this instrument, the Dobson Spectrophotometer. And this instrument, as I said uh, before, is an instrument that 
won't show up, won't show any friction, unlikely the satellite instrument. Because this instrument was invented by uh, Gordon Dobson in Oxford in the 20s. And this is his first instrument uh, we still have in London in the Science Museum. And this instrument is basically still the same, only the, we had right at the beginning, there were um, photographic plates, but they were uh, in the late 1920s, they were uh, replaced by photographic um, cells. And that is the only thing that was really changed about the instrument. And so there, this is a highly robust uh, instrument you have that doesn't change over time. And there are maybe 150, I think, or so that, are, that were built over the years and that formed the ozone net, uh, that are part of the ozone network of this global infrastructure in the sun, sense of uh, Paul Edwards. And what, the, what was the outcome of this work now of uh, ozone observations in Antarctica of uh, Jonathan Shankling, as you can see here, and his ozone spectro, Dobson spectrophotometer in Antarctica at Halley Bay. So this instrument was brought down to Antarctica since the International Ge Geophysical Year, as I said, and this is their first publication. Uh, and it took them a really long time to publish something on ozone. It took them basically 15 years to publish this report and to tell the public that there's not much to tell. And uh, actually, that, and that is very much what fundamental science is about. You do observations, you think, oh, there might be a connection with meteorology and it might help us in, uh, to have much better uh, me, uh, predictions. It turned out that wasn't the case. And what it turned out, uh, you, there are variations and it, there are seasonal variations and so on, but it, it wasn't really the most exciting stuff to do and especially not to report because they had trouble uh, re, to, um, to remain funded, to that their funding would be kept up and that they could keep on building this important environmental database. And that is of course, because um, yeah, they, were, they had troubles um, really selling a good story on this because of course there were, there were not many stories to be sold, but uh, nobody could foresee that there will be a really big story to be sold in the end. But um, this is to, just to give you an idea what how they published their reports. Here, are, these are the findings, the average ozone values that were measured, and they are tabulated in this form. And it sees this is a really robust database. It's highly robust. And this is uh, to show how this is, uh, these are the, um, the, the typical field chart, how you would know, how you would do the observations. And it, these are quite complicated observations. You have to be really careful when you select the wavelengths, it says which, which it shows you exactly which number of instrument was used because each, uh, each Dobson spectrophotometer has a, has a specific number, is identifiable. And then you have all these calculations that have to be done and so on. So it's pretty, it's, uh, it's a pretty hard work. And uh, at the, during the late 1970s, uh, the, the researchers of the British Antarctic Survey, Jonathan Shanklin and Joe Farman, were observing that the ozone values were going down. And here we have Jonathan, Jonathan Shanklin in Antarctica in 1982, bringing down a new instrument to check if, it, if the instrument is still calibrated well. So they had other instruments that they calibrated, of course, against their the, uh, against each other, and they would bring down a new instrument to see does does are the ozone values really going down or is this just our instrument? And so here you have to in the hut you have the instrument that observed the values going down, and this is the new instrument that he brought down from the British Antarctic Survey from Cambridge, and and it produced actually the same readings. So they were sure that what they are observing is ozone depletion above Halley Bay. Uh, and that's happening every year, late September, beginning of October, ozone values are going dramatically down. And this more and more so. So Jonathan Shanklin, he wrote to NASA, unfortunately to the wrong people, but he tried to reach them and to reach out and say, hey guys, do you know, did you see anything like we do on your, in your satellite data? 
we are observing ozone values are going down and values are around 200 Dobson units, which is considerably lower than our 1957-72 average. That's their famous report. And then he would write, we would be interested to know if this is confirmed by satellite data. If so, is it possibly, uh, is it possibly connected with the El Chichon eruption and so on, blah, blah. So uh, this was addressed to the wrong people, the wrong group. They would write back, no, we're not engaged in ozone observations anymore and so on. So they went on and they published their paper. They didn't get any response, so they didn't get any response from NASA. So they published their famous paper in Nature in 1985 and said there are large losses of ozone above Antarctica. And there, here is where things really got interesting, because first of all, um, the paper was published. Um, this is what Jonathan Shanklin, he drew this graph before the paper was published. And then when they sent it out, this is how what this graph became. It became, first of all, you can see the abscissa here. It's a really, it's pretty large. And now we're going over here. Now it's they shortened the abscissa a lot. So now we have a steep decline. And he connected this also with something else. He connected this also uh, with, um, an, he made an inverse correlation actually. On the right-hand side of this graph, so you see here, first of all, you see average values of ozone going down over the years from 1957 on to, until 1984, 80, 80, 85 always going down uh, um, from the late 70s onwards with a really steep decline. And then you have next to the graph, you have uh, F11 and F12. And go from top to down, these values are increasing. It's 100 and 200 and 200 and 400 going downwards. And F11 and F12 are the two CFC products th that are mostly sold, Freon 11 and Freon 12. Those were the most distributed CFC products at the time. And so they made this correlation. Probably this is linked to Freon 11 and Freon 12 because these concentrations, if they go up, they're, they're all gone. So that, that wasn't proven at all, but that was the assumption. In. And there was another assumption in, the, in an interview for the British uh, Library, uh, Joe Farman said, well, we tried to make this really compelling by just putting another graph underneath. We put the February values underneath that below. And then you can see directly with the direct comparison, you can see, okay, this is not happening in February. This is always happening in October. So this is a seasonal phenomenon and, th th and there are clearly, there's clearly something happening there. And that was their most important point to bring through the message that something really important is happening in Antarctica. What is interesting is that Joe Farmer said in that same interview that people weren't really excited about the news. They said there was, from the scientific community, there was little feedback until one guy came around. That was Bob Watson from NASA, a British guy working for NASA. And he called and said, "Come, wouldn't you, uh, like to come down to the embassy, American embassy, and look at my images that I'm bringing around. I've got satellite pictures of the ozone hole. Would you like, to, would you care to take a look at them? And that's where things got very interesting. Because that's the point where NASA comes into the game. And this is, this is where I would like to invite you to switch with me perspective and to have a look at the other side of the story, at the NASA side story of this, of the ozone hole discovery. So, when we switch now to the NASA side, here we switch radical the perspective because now we're moving into space. We're moving on to the Nimbus 7 satellite and we're moving to the TOMS instrument, the Total Ozone Mapping Spectrophotometer. And just as ozone research in Halley Bay, there are a lot of assumptions that go, of course, into these observations. I, as I told at the beginning, 150,000 up to 200,000 measurements a day so those are a lot of readings that are coming in. And they had attached to their different readings on different wavelengths. That's how you measure total ozone. They had attached to that of different profiles, assumptions about how is ozone distributed within the column of the stratosphere and atmosphere. 
especially stratosphere, of course, like at the height of 10, 15 kilometers, um, wh where you have uh, different concentrations. And they had to treat the, the data, of course, in a very specific way. They, they had this iterative process, how to process their data. And to each process, we have a, a flag attached. So that means we, there are certain conditions that have to be met that this data is not flagged and that it can go on. And we work our way down to the production uh, within the production process of this proce uh, data processing. So that's how they produced that data of the TOMS instrument. And one of those flags that could show up would be ozone values are below 180 Dobson units, which is basically what the condition of an ozone, where, where an ozone hole starts uh, from the perspective of today. And this what condition, what there was a, a flag attached to this condition. And they actually saw that coming up in the 1980s. In the 1980s, they produced, in 1984, they produced, before the, the paper from uh, Joe Farman and John Shanklin, they produced actually an ozone hill image for a conference that was held in Prague, a geophysical meeting. And they produced this very first ozone hole map. Um, although they, they produced this because they had a lot of anomalies in their data and, that, and they thought, well, it's maybe worthwhile exploring this. And that's where they produced this map with uh, specifically the data that is, includes also ozone values below 100, 180 Dobson units. And this is what you have in the middle of this, on the, of this graph, of this, uh, um, of this map, ozone map of the Antarctic stratosphere, and uh, oh, the whole southern hemisphere here. And uh, these, oh, these, this is the first ozone hole map from the late uh, from the 1984, published for that conference. But th th nobody noticed about really this map. Nobody got to see really th this first map, and nobody talked about that really. When people got to talk, what talk about ozone was when NASA sent for a press release, they confirmed the British findings. Uh, and that, that was published in the New York Times where they sent one of their false color maps to Walter Sullivan. The, the, Walter Sullivan is the famous journalist of the New York Times who covered also the International, Ge International Geophysical Year, one of the most famous science writers of the Cold War. And he uh, published this map and he introduced the term ozone hole, the metaphor of the ozone hole, which, which from there on took, an, uh, uh, took the ozone depletion phenomena to a whole new level because it introduced this new global imagery of a hole in the ozone layer produced every year above Antarctica. And this made the story really an, an environmental success story, if I may say so, because um, it, I think it, it powered a lot um, what would happen during uh, the Montreal Protocol, during the um, negotiations on the, on the ozone, uh, on the regulation of CFC substances to protect the ozone layer, and the Montreal Protocol in, of 1987 that was signed uh, to protect the ozone layer and to phase out CFCs. I, I think, although um, the negotiators of the Montreal Protocol said that we kept these findings outside of the negotiations because we, there was a diplomatic strategy of the US. But uh, in reality, you couldn't escape this whole new imagery because this was all, it was in the press. You would see images on TV and in evening news everywhere. It was basically, it was in a lot of different news outlets. So, um, and why is this important? Well, this is important because this image uh, because NASA produced the global image of the of the ozone, and therefore it produced a global, a powerful global imagery to which they could attach the famous ozone hole metaphor, and they could do this with the isoline tradition, uh, which is a very old tradition, of course, that we know from many geophysical phenomena. We know this from geo, geo, uh, geo from magnetic. Uh, cartography from Halley already from 1701. We have the first isoline maps, but for geo, geo uh, magnetic phenomena. And this, uh, there's a very long tradition in the geosciences for, for, of using contour lines or isolines to predict, to 
um, to visualize a global phenomena. And here, NASA uses it for the ozone hole. And it would make its way also into the reports. And Bob Watson, the guy who called Joe Farman to come down to the embassy, the British scientist, he was at the head of the, all, the, all the assessments that were made on ozone the, 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 that are the basis of the model for the IPCC later for climate change. The, so what the, these, the, the ozone assessments were basically the same stuff we're doing today for with the IPCC for climate change. That's what was first organized for ozone. And Bob Watson was at the head, at the head of that. And they, that's where these images were also introduced. His maps he wanted to show to Joe Farman. That, that these are the examples where the, this map was also introduced. And um, it would be also, of course, in the press, but I, I won't be talking too much about that maybe. Uh, what is interesting to see is that in 1985, 86, we don't know a lot about the actual causes of the Antarctic ozone hole. Where, and why is that the case? We do know, of course, uh, Sherwood Rowland, um, Mario Molina, and Paul Crutzen, all, all, all um, they, th those three received the Nobel Prize, of course, for their discoveries on ozone depletion uh, and their work in atmospheric chemistry. Uh, but they made the link between CFCs and ozone depletion. But what one didn't know, and that was already uh, in the 70s, but what one didn't know in the 80s now, with the ozone hole above Antarctica, what is happening actually in the stratosphere? Why is that happening? Uh, there were different hypotheses that had to be tested, and they were tested within different experiments. There were three experiments that had to be conducted, and that is where NASA had to move out of its comfort zone, and they had to move out of space science and go into field science, if I, if I can say so, because they had to equip within those three experiments, especially the last one, the Airborne Antarctic Ozone Experiment, they had to equip planes, two types of planes, one that would fly in the stratosphere, one lower, and uh, this like a passenger machine, the DC-8, that is, uh, you can see you have the overhead lockers and everything, but inside that plane you have all the instruments. So you have the laboratory stuffed into an airplane and that will be used to fly into the field. And the same thing with the era two above the DC, the light at the top, you can see it. It is packed with instruments and basically laboratory instruments, if, you, if, if one can say so. And they will, be, go, they will be, be sent into the field to observe directly what is happening in the Antarctic stratosphere during austral winter in Sept late September, beginning of October. And uh, for that, NASA had to engage and had to cooperate with many other institutions. They couldn't do that on their own, of course. So they had to cooperate with, uh, with NOAA, with uh, CMA, with NFS, with, with plenty of other institutions. And that is important for our story because um, when you think about um, the, the field lab or the, about the ways uh, the teams communicated and did not communicate with each other and so on. That's very important because here we have a collaboration where NASA is moving into a field that are, they're not so comfortable with usually because th that's not the kind of, ex well, it's not the main business they usually do. If you, if you would ask the satellite guys, that's certainly not what they, what they will be thinking about the best way to to gain knowledge on the stratosphere wouldn't be to do that, but in order to solve the questions involved in the production or, or annual production of the ozone hole, that's precisely what had to be done. And um, it was the only way to test all the hypotheses uh, that were developed. And one was from Susan Solomon. Susan Solomon had the idea that is uh, that the polar stratospheric clouds in Antarctica that form only in Antarctica when we have very, very low um, um, temperature conditions. When the vo polar vortex is closed, the atmosphere and the stratosphere uh, is sort of blocked during the winter and the polar stratospheric clouds can form and there we have heterogeneous uh, chemistry going on that will produce 
massive ozone loss with CFCs on these clouds, breaking up chlorine released, and then you have catalytic reactions and so on. And so that was sort of Susan Salomon's idea. Uh, and this hypothesis was actually tested. And it might, for the STS community amongst us, it might sound um, maybe a bit weird that this old philosophy of science perspective of testing science perspective testing hypothesis and coming to a conclusion that, that usually one says that's not what happens very often in science that's not how science is very, done very often but in this case it was actually the case and uh, there is one author a philosopher of science Maureen Christie she she wrote a book uh, uh, the ozone layer, a philosophy of science perspective, and she explains that in that book very well, actually, how this was done and how these different hypotheses were uh, developed and how they were tested and so on. And um, it, a, a very convincing story, in my opinion. And so um, another thing NASA learned from this was we, we have to do better at communicating this idea. And that's where the Goddard Space Flight Center, the center that developed the TOMS instrument and that, that uh, were producing the images and were getting the data, they decided to introduce the Scientific Visualization Studio in the 90s and to invent environmental or geophysical storytelling. Well, not invented, but to, to, to largely improve their abilities to communicate their findings. And that's when these new ozone hole images came in, or these these more um, these globe-like uh, visualizations of ozone, where you have now a, a much better sense of how this the, how the whole uh, in in the, a more three-dimensional feeling about ozone uh, above Antarctica and how as and, and they would animate these movies and they would do ozone hole movies. Although they existed also from the very beginning, they would of course largely improve these visualizations and make a much more compelling visual story uh, uh, to tell the story of ozone in Antarctica. So I guess that was a, also a very important learning process for NASA in order to engage in a, in um, in in better communication strategies to in order to talk to the wider public but also to to politics. And uh, so this is also an important lesson from the ozone hole case. And so maybe if I can um, conclude uh, my my talk. I think uh, my time is probably uh, is already. Uh, uh, it's I was you. I, I talked a bit longer already than forty minutes, I believe. Um, so, uh, what, if we want to conclude about a few things uh, on in this story, I think um, it's a good a good thing uh, a, a good way to uh, uh, to think about global environmental data is to acknowledge that all this data is very, uh, has very local production places. It means uh, that uh, also uh, if you look at Goddard or if you look at uh, the British Antarctic Survey, if you go to Cambridge, these are very local contexts of production that you have to look at very carefully if you want to understand the story. And the dichotomies, if one usually makes between small against big science uh, uh, of field against laboratory and so on, these dichotomies, they, they, maybe they work well to tell the story, but they don't tell us everything about in this story. Because all of these oppositions, they are important for the story, but they, uh, they don't tell us why it worked in the end, why, why actually uh, this became a, such an important environmental success story because most of it was produced in the border zones because th that is the case when you conduct science in Antarctica, the knowledge is produced within border zones there. And um, all the teams that were involved had to engage also in a dialogue and in, in exchange. The, although it was very limited at the beginning, Na the best British Antarctic surveys, they wouldn't get any answer from NASA. And when NASA was looking at ground data for the, the Goddard Space Flight Team, they were looking at, for ground data. They couldn't actually find the British uh, observations because their latest observations, they weren't actually published. 
because the British refused to dilute their data in the global ozone network. It's the global ozone network is what we call the red books or what the scientists call the red books. These are books of ozone data that are collected globally uh, for global observations. Uh, but they are done with different instruments, different teams and so on. And the British at some point said, oh, we won't send that our data there anymore because we don't want our data diluted in this science that is not done in a very good way in their opinion. So they kept their own standards, their own instruments, and their own, um, uh, and they kept this sort of their own institutional tradition, which only enhanced actually their authority to speak about ozone in Antarctica, because they're the, the only real experts on ozone in Antarctica. But they, it also limited a lot the communication capabilities with other communities. And that is basically what we can learn from this story. That um, what is funny when we look at the NASA doing their field experiments, going into flying their planes from Punta Arenas into the Antarctic stratosphere, when they do that, they will actually um, not engage with, with the British Antarctic Survey. They won't ask the British Antarctic Survey to come in to join them in the field studies. And that is pr pretty significant for this case, I think, because we have there really two institutions that couldn't really communicate with each other, that have their own institutional traditions and so on, and that um, that that import that produce very important findings, but that would be be much much better off if they would be capable of communicating with each other, and. So what we learn basically from this story is um, that you, you can build a very robust database. And that's what the database on ozone in Antarctica is for the Halley station, for Halley Bay. Uh, and, but it's no use to have a very robust database if you can't, um, if you can't share that data with a wider community. And, um, it's um, in, in, and on the other hand, you you need also a global perspective, of, of course, to understand uh, the global dynamics of uh, stratos of the stratospheric ozone loss uh, in Antarctica every year. And um, so, yeah, I guess well, these are just some ideas I have um, about. Um, ozone and uh, field and laboratory work in Antarctica. And um, yeah, I uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to discuss your questions. Yes, thank you, Sebastian, for this exciting talk. I have heard this story a number of times and you manage always to bring something new to it that makes it still more fascinating. <laughs> so thank you. Um, now, Chongling, uh, do you want to follow Anne? Please. Thanks. Thanks, Gemma, for giving me the floor. Um, and I uh, thanks uh, Sebastian for um, for um, yeah this presentation, and uh, which is like Gemma said, it. Uh, it it provides new details, uh, very interesting details on um, a story that by and large, I thought I knew, but uh, <laughs> uh, there's always, uh, there are always new things or things that I've forgotten and things that I've overlooked. At any rate, I, uh, I'll present you with some um, very generic uh, comments that uh, alas, um, will not reach to the level of, um, of uh, interesting historical detail as uh, you were able to cover. So my, um, my comments um, are brief and they uh, divide between a comment on the discovery of the ozone hole and um, on um, the a second comment on, on um, like you uh, introduced here very nicely, the, the um, um, demand of experimental um, ascertainment. And then third, I would um, 
briefly raise uh, the historical dimension of, um, of uh, well, the ozone hole in particular and field science in general. So um, about the discovery of the ozone hole, what was it that elevated a mere ozone depletion, the British discovery made in 1985, um, by the ozone hole, the concept which appeared in a title of a groundbreaking paper by Crutzen et al. in uh, a year later. And we know, we know that, that this was earlier. Um, 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 the, 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 the <clears throat> The ozone hole was um, a little earlier mentioned in the New York Times. First, um, and here I refer to um, to um, other work of Sebastian that he didn't cover here now in his talk. The concept of the ozone hole was already in existence for several decades, albeit in very different contexts. Um, like you have written about um, astro making astronomical observations and about a Cold War context. Um, and uh, so two different contexts in which the ozone hole was already in existence. Uh, apart from the concept of the ozone hole, there was the Nazis technique of drawing contour maps and it was already established practice wisdom. And I, one could say without the iconography of the contour line, no ozone hole. Recently, um, Brian Cantwell Smith, a professor of artificial, artificial intelligence, compared a map of the islands in Georgia, Georgian Bay in Ontario with an aerial photograph of the same area. The map leaves no doubt about what the islands are. But on the photograph, it is much harder to make out where an island ends and the sea begins. It is not even clear how many islands there are. As Cantwell Smith observes, we live in a world of discrete mesoscale objects. Artificial intelligence cannot produce those objects for us. So it is us who do that. And we do so by bringing our concepts to the world. Put differently, Data do not bring out contour map maps by themselves. In common scientific parlance, they need to be digitally enhanced. But, uh, even, but on even programs that do the enhancing produce the mesoscale objects that we are looking for. The ozone hole, just like simul sim similar visual gestalts, embody theory. We may also say that uh, the ozone hole is a theoretical object. Now I move to um, the assert critical ascertainment of the existence of visual objects. In classical natural science, whenever we want to verify the existence of a theoretical object, we turn to the laboratory to produce the object under controlled conditions. Obviously, that's not possible here. As Rob Kohler has remarked, and I'm referring to the same book that uh, with which uh, Sebastian uh, waved to all of us, uh, landscapes and landscapes. As Rob Kohler has remarked, the field scientist searches patiently for the spot where nature has performed the experiment for her. Data analysis then is not so much producing theory inductively, but is ascertaining whether ceteris paribus clauses have been met. And I would like to add, data analysis can do so only up to a point. At any rate, putting computer scientists in the realm of experimental reasons give them, uh, is giving them a more circumscri circumscribed space. We may also look at simulation modeling, a practice which likewise can be seen as experimenting in silico, as some people say, uh, not in vitro, not the real um, classical laboratory experiment. But now there is a different dimension again, as the historical dimension, and in particular, the historical dimension of the ozone hole. 
And I'm referring yet again to the work of Rob Kohler when I point out that in reconstructing the coming into existence of the ozone hole above the Antarctic, we are not merely analyzing conditions which could produce an ozone hole anywhere and anytime in a regular and controlled fashion. We are also looking at the historical conditions which made that the ozone hole could manifest itself at this particular time and this particular spot. Natural events are inherently historical. Field sciences have something importantly historical to them. And when they neglect the historical dimension, they would do so at their peril. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tugli, for those uh, great comments and um, uh, for some actually some new input, actually, because and you rightly um, point at uh, landscapes and labscapes, because I recommend for anybody that reading as a to get to at grips with the, how complicated the um, how complicated these interactions have become through in the 20th century, actually, and how important it, they have become for to understanding uh, what kind of science, how science works uh, in, in many different fields. Not big, but, although Rob Kohler, of course, talks about a lot about biology, ecology, it's also uh, it is very highly relevant, of course, for the geophysical sciences as well. The, um, I think the um, um, uh, you probably will be talking about that in your next uh, in your in your talk next week uh, when you when you talk about discrete mesoscale objects uh, Brian Smith uh, refers to uh, and um, and you, uh, and you, you said that the uh, the embodied uh, that the ozone hole is very much like an embodied theory of course and without the contour lines it wouldn't exist so to speak. And that's, I think it's very important that it's good that you uh, point that out because we like to think about global environmental objects like, uh, like, like very much like they have become highly naturalized to us. They have become naturalized because of their, the, the political implications they have because the, they, the ozone hole metaphor is in that case very interesting. You mentioned that, that, that there's a longer history, of course, of the metaphor that was used in other contexts before. But once it became this environmental metaphor, it I, I had a whole new dynamic, dynamic, it brought in a whole new dynamic actually. And this dynamic has a lot to do with the ways it was visualized, I think. And, um, and that's why it is important to think about data and visualizations, uh, how, what, the, what our perception does when we, what, when we look at these objects, how, how our brain actually um, uh, copes with these. And um, I, I think another aspect that is important is uh, about these images is that they still have, also, that they are, still have many drawbacks as well. You, one can, of course, look at the, the convenience of having a global perspective on the stratosphere, but there are also many drawbacks that come with their, um, uh, with their global, with the global perspective always, because you lose, of course, the connectedness to the, to experience, to what we, as uh, what we can experience and what we can, what, and it's very far outside of our human scale. And that's why, um, that's what many of these images stand of, accused of. And they are, of course, in that sense, uh, very psychologically sterile. And that's uh, something, um, that's another aspect, I think one should, uh, one has to take into account when one thinks about global environmental objects, because they're very far removed from our experience. But the, the, the um, example you gave from the photograph and the map, the difference between photograph and map, that photographs on uh, automatically maps is, uh, is a very uh, good example. Thank you for that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you, Chungi. So um, I do have a question. If anyone, uh, if nobody else has one uh, so far. Um, so because yes. you talk about uh, the importance of storytelling and mm -hmm. communicating um, data or satellite data. 
um, also as a form of uh, institutional propaganda for NASA. Um, but so, uh, do you think, or, or do you have examples that suggest that satellite data about environmental um, ideas or phenomena, uh, such as ozone or CO2 um, concentration or sea level rise, um, require or carry with specific ways of communicating or visualizing uh, as compared to other forms of uh, data gathering like surface stations or ships or balloons? And if yes, to what extent uh, this, uh, this, this necessity or this yeah, is linked to the technical nature of the technology or is more, rather, more of a choice of those involved in producing and communicating and, and this data. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, thank you for that interesting question. Um, uh, so when they, um, I, I have had a look, I, I conducted of course some interviews and I, I had a look at many, there are also many oral histories out there. And um, it is difficult to know precisely why, um, for example, the Goddard Space Flight people, why the, from the Goddard Space Flight Center, why they chose specifically the contour line uh, or the isoline to produce uh, their ozone maps. I think one reason is uh, that um, it is they use polar projection. And in the polar projection, you have to use polar projection if you want to show the, the polar regions. It's the only useful projection. You don't have to use it, but it's the only useful projection uh, in order to um, to show data of that region. That it, it's the most commonly used one. And uh, when you do that, and you and you do and um, and it explains also actually the sector principle why uh, why we have sectors in Antarctica, why there are wedges. I think it is also closely connected to the polar. Uh, projection because um, that's how how the projection works and it's the most convenient way to divide anything within a polar projection. Um, uh, so the, the if you want to project now, if you want to put data onto that map, uh, I, I believe the ice line intuitively what they used the ice line tradition it was a pretty good choice because uh, it it spatializes the phenomena very well. It creates surfaces with which you can actually, and uh, with which you can uh, create very good, um, very good, the, the whole phenomenon. Uh, you, the black hole, for example, is also the very first uh, Jean-Pierre Luminet in 1979, when he, we, he did his simulated photograph of a black hole in that paper, he also used the isoline to to, to uh, visualize the black, the first black hole. Uh, so this uh, for uh, isolines are very good for to to depict holes, so to speak. And um, it, it one could also say it, the other the inversely, it's because of the isoline that holes exist. And um, so that is that is one point. And um, that, that they used false colors to do that uh, was uh, well uh, in one oral history interview I read uh, where two of the scientists they were discussing they had their maps and then they were coloring starting to color in by hand their first maps and they said oh we, we should do a, a computer routine for that I can do that for you and so on and that's how they produced their first ozone false color ozone maps with a computer um, routine and uh, I won't go into the technical details but um, there, there were, yeah, there were good some um, some good reasons to do that, and the um, there is a long tradition also within uh, meteorology, of course, and um, so as, and for if you are depicting atmospheric or stratospheric phenomena, so there is there is also a visual tradition, so to speak. There is a, a as I said, a long-standing tradi cartographic tradition as well, reaching right back to Halley. Edmund Halley in, in 1701, his first isogon map, but um, they're also much more recently within meteorology, for example. And um, now, why? Um, now you you asked also um, um, why, if, if for example, the the Keeling curve 
we all know the Keeling curve, it's just a steep rise. It tells two stories, the Keeling curve. The Keeling curve tells us, of course, global ozone concentrations that they rise from the inter international geophysical year 1957 from 310 ppm to today to 415 ppm. It's a continuous rise. And uh, as um, in, um, uh, how's the, uh, I, I forgot his name. Um, uh, in environmental history, you have a great article on the Keeling curve. Uh, and in that article, he says that um, it's a, there are two stories told. One is about um, the natural history of the, the curve, meaning you, it's like the planet breathing. So that's the oscillation of the Keeling curve. And then you have the unnatural side, so to speak, of the curve, meaning that it's always rising. And that is the human, um, uh, the anthropogenetic force of that of that curve, so to speak. And these unnatural and this natural history, they come together within the Keeling curve. And um, and I think and so you could think about the human history also in terms of PPM. So instead of putting down the year numbers, you could also just think about the human history in in PPM for CO2 concentration. So that was that is, a, I, I think, a nice suggestion, of course. But it uh, tells us also something about this curve, that it's, it speaks as a curve, as a global phenomena. With ozone, you have something much more localized. In this, of course, it's a global phenomena, a global imaginary. But it's, of course, localized. And it has to be mapped precisely. And, um, and that's why and it has its origin, of course, in a very local reading in very local observations within Halley, on Halley Station in Halley Bay. And that is, I think, a, a very important aspect of the ozone story. That is, it has a very, just like the Keeling curve really in Mauna Loa, it has a very local story to it. And, um, but this localness is, um, uh, counts also for the global perspective because it's uh, as a regional phenomenon you, you have to map it out in that way so um yeah i think um I, i'm not sure if i really answered your question but um does that does that answer your question Gemma? yes partially, partially. But, uh, yes because uh, as you perfectly know um, different forms of visualizing may carry different political messages and have I may have different public impact. So uh, just your insights about why the ozone is a whole, sea level rise is a curve and, and, and not a whole. Maybe it could be also depicted with ice lines or um, so I, I don't know if it has something to do with the audience uh, to what these images are meant to be addressed or I don't know what are your insights on that it depends on how many variables you want to take into account so if you if with ozone you want to have if you want to know its geographical distribution it's uh, uh it's important to do produce th those maps as the, as NASA does it or if you want to if you just want to have an in global indicator just like the CO2, it, the Keeling curve is enough, of course, but it's it wouldn't make sense to have, um, it, yeah, it, could, it does make sense. And we also have those maps, of course, but it's, um, you produce something else. Uh, you produce another kind of knowledge, of course, uh, more, more detail is given to the local. That is actually what is happening also with um, IPCC understood that they, for a long time, they had a tradition of moving to the global, uh, to including mostly global perspectives, global um, climate maps and so on. And that now, when the, over the recent decade, we're moving much more into local projections, into very highly more localized regional models and so on, and into regional um, depictions, visualizations, which help better engage problems, but have a, get a local, more local perspective on, into things and it, to connect also more to local communities, which are also, of course always left out of these highly globalized perspectives. And, we, and um, yeah, I think that is a very important aspect to think when we're thinking about global uh, environmental images. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, uh, now, Christine, do you want to address your question by yourself? 
Thank you, Sebastian, for your talk. I want to follow up on Gemma's question. Um, so as I was looking through your slides earlier today, um, it seemed to me that the, the presentation of the data with the isolines made it appear that the data was extremely certain, as opposed to the graphical presentation, which showed the error bars, which is typical in science-y kinds of things, okay, that we show the error bars. But the general public sees error bars and thinks in their mind, their data are really shaky. Huh? Yeah. Like, why should, why should I trust why should I trust this? But I can look over here and look, I've got, I've got solid lines and that must mean that they know what they're talking about. Mm. So is, is NASA in this case getting ready to make the case that there is a major problem? Um, and so they're going to accentuate that problem by making it look like the data are extraordinarily solid for public distribution, knowing that the general public is never going to see those, those graphs with the dots and the, and the error bars that extend from them. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's very good, very good point. Uh, actually, the, when you think about the Iceland tradition, uh, its history, you understand very well why it's so good at inventing this uniform and Highly confident, highly confident visual space in a sense that it it creates continuity there where you don't necessarily have continuity. It's as if you've measured really every spot on it, on the map. And it's the same when Humboldt, Alexander von Humboldt, when he introduced his isolines in uh, in in 1814, 1812, 1814, the iso um, uh, the isothermal his isotherms. Uh, and when he introduced that, he for his map of the northern hemisphere, it's almost a it's a, a northern hemisphere map with a sinuous line like this, different iso different isotherms. And when he introduced that, he used only about fifty readings or something like that. So he selected fifty to 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 depict the whole nor northern hemisphere, the temperature, the average temperature on different isotherms. So you create continuity there and a high confidence in, 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 in something that is, of course, very weak mm -hmm. on, a, on a databases behind that. And the same is with the first ozone map uh, NASA produced, they artificially uh, they, they, as I said, you need profiles of the ozone in the vertical distribution of ozone in, in order to produce those maps. And since they had, hadn't a profile for uh, below 180 Dobson units, and how they could, uh, they just artificially pro projected that profile. They produced that, they said, okay, we'll just say it, this profile should look like that. We will just arbitrarily say it looks like that and in order to be able to produce our image. And that's what they did. And it's it, later when they went back to their data and actually used the new profiles they, they were given, um, they, they, they saw that they, they predict that it worked actually pretty well because that visualization technique, it, it actually hides pretty well um, the, um, it, the errors you can make within your uh, in your work, yeah. so to speak. It's a very powerful visualization technique, and it's also a highly imaginary one in the sense not that it's all it's all uh, it's only errors, blah blah. No, not at all. It's very um, in the sense that it's very um, as a it is powerfully um, a psychologically powerful in a sense. Yeah, so they use that. Um, of course, to um, well, um, now there was just uh, the story with the how how it was implicated in the political process. That is something I will I'm uh, investigating at the moment with a colleague of mine, where we're looking at how would, could this be mobilized within the negotiation process. Although the chief negotiator of the United States says. These images, we had to keep them outside of the process because we did we didn't know what the outcome would be of the all of these experiments in Antarctica. What, how if we would have something um, contradicting our predictions and so on, then we would have a weaker basis to 
to have a strong political engagement and a phase out of CFC. So they had, we need the precautionary principle to be the most important principle to follow and, the, and to have a phase out. And we don't want, we don't need the exact, conf, the, the very confirmation from the field experiments in Antarctica. And so that's something I will look into with a colleague now. Sebastian, yeah. hello. Hello. Am I allowed to speak? Hello, hello. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think uh, you have covered a very wide range, starting from science, technology, to philosophy, to history. I have, a, I have taken up the whole thing. Maybe I will communicate to you later. Mm -hmm. But I have a question now. Yeah. That is, the, the, this you have again and again highlighted that until and unless there is communication amongst the authorities and there is communication from the authority to the down, that is to the public as through New York Times as it was done at that point of time by Sullivan, mm -hmm. until that happens, how can a knowledge like that of climate change or that of ozone hole how if it is not communicated down to the local level at the common popular language, how it can store for innovative ideas. See, I spoke in vernacular in radio about ozone hole in 1986, seven, after the ozone hole report was published by UNEP, some or other, no communication was, see, it may be that our institutional authorities were weak, or I'm not sure of that. I have not then done that analysis. I'm only in the reconstructing mode now. But I feel that what you emphasize, that point is very, very important, that you have to communicate effectively by the storytelling format to the people. What's your take on that? Mm. Well, oh, thank you very much for this interesting question. Yeah, I, I, I believe uh, that, yeah, indeed, it's, it's especially with environmental issues, of course, that are, that are so important as uh, the ozone hole and now, of course, with climate, climate change, uh, the communication issue is, of course, uh, extre extremely important. It is the, one of the most important, important parts about the uh, scientific work when it comes to uh, well to, to policy questions and uh, what what can uh, not only policy questions but also uh, of course what uh, what we as a society or we uh, very on a very local level what can be what what can be done uh, so I think in an ozone case. Uh, uh, it was since uh, so as I said with since the 70s it was or we we had of course the ozone in the 70s we had the ozone was first we had the supersonic supersonic transportation uh, debate then we had the ozone wars about the spray cans and then um, came the ozone hole and the, and the Montreal protocol with its phase out and uh, the the communication side is was I think very well understood by NASA not uh, from early on by with the, their early ozone maps and especially also with with the at Goddard Space Flight Center when they introduced the scientific visualization studio that professionalized and institutionalized this role in, in a very important way because now from then on, you have a, a professional storytelling. Some pe people that are only doing that, that will take the data and try to produce compelling stories about the environment, about the global environment. And uh, I think that is, uh, I th that is one of the most important moves they made at Goddard Space Flight Center in order to get the data also into uh, discussion, public discussions, uh, especially also in the policy circles. Thank you, Sebastian, again, for this exciting talk. And to all the audience, remember the next week we have uh, Chung Ling Va, same time, not same place, but <laughs> in Barcelona, <laughs> at least. <laughs> so um, thank you very much and hope seeing you there. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.